my lecture was a lot less informative than the last one, but more just a display of all of the many ways that these fractures can go bad, which is really what the, the biggest part of this is. So I have no disclosures. Um, so patients that come in, elderly patients, even young patients that are at baseline ill with diabetes and, and the comorbidities that go with diabetes are chronic steroid users or have significant vascular disease. Kind of whenever you see them, your gut's going to say, oh, God, like, uh, this is not going to be good. And you're kind of right, and your instinct might be to do your best to manage this non-operatively, but actually um, that's just kind of the opposite of what we need to be doing. Um, they're not ever going to be good surgical candidates, but we kind of have to just deal with that. Amazingly, um, there are actually relatively good evidence that says, you know, we should really be fixing this. You know, if you look at this, the great recommendations are all Bs. Usually when you look at this, they're Cs and Is, and it's never good, but kind of looking at the success rate of limb salvage and sort of giving patients that are um, older and are sort of uh, dealing with the comorbidities of diabetes, they do better with fixation. So even though you kind of, your gut says, oh, I really don't want to do this if I can avoid it, that's, you got to ignore it. So the workups are really important and um, because they are complicated patients, but we need to opt, the, the thing to help get you through managing one of these patients is optimization. So anybody that comes in that's a vasculopath or a long-standing diabetic that you just look at their skin and you go, oof, that doesn't look good, you, you need to get ABIs on. You need to know that the incisions you're going to make are going to heal. And if they're not going to heal, you need to see if there's vascular procedures that they can do to help enhance it. And it's a little bit tricky when patients have splints on and casts on, but it's sort of part of the workup to make sure you, if you can, address that beforehand. Um, I see a lot of these, and I think I see more of these as they come to me when they failed, but it, and it's a little trickier to do that when it's the when you're the person seeing them the first time, because they do have a splint, you can't get the cast off to go get the ABIs, but uh, as part of the workup, it's, it's critical. Um, I think if you're going to be dealing with patients like this, you need to have a good relationship with uh, somebody that um, can help you when the skin starts to go bad. So having a good relationship with plastics. And then even things like we talk about in general, not operating until the skin and the swelling is down. Doing your best to make sure you manage blisters and wound things ahead of time. And the other thing is, is just making sure to sort of help decrease we know this from the joints literature, we know this from lots of literature, that perioperative glycemic control is a really big risk factor for infection. And these are people that are prone to infection. So making sure all of this is, again, everything you can do, every modifiable risk factor you have, modify it to be in your favor. So uh, I think the most important part, uh, if there, this is one of the key things to sort of take away from this, is you need to know how bad these can be as much for you so you have a plan and you're already thinking the next step ahead, but also that the, the patients know. You know, complication rates are really, really high. You know, when you look in the literature, amputation rates in uh, patients with diabetes, they talk about ranging from 4 to 20, almost 20 percent in people with uh, ankle fractures. And that, those are real big numbers. Um, Complications with infections and failures, it's, it's all there. So they need to know going in, and you need to be prepared going into managing patients like this. Uh, identifying the severity of their diabetes is a part, of, part of helping you sort of prepare for that. If you have patients that are coming in with diabetes and renal failure or diabetes and neuropathy or um, any sort of complicated comorbid diabetes, their rates, if you look at the p-values on this chart, you know, superficial infections, um, way more uh, problems with uh, revision, more likely to have revision surgery. Overall complications are all worse. And then you start to add in neuropathy um, as a specific subset of the, that population, and the risk factors um, and odds ratios for everything goes way up. Uh, pretty much anybody that comes into your office who has an ankle fracture, you need to use a Sims Weinstein film on. Probably anybody you see, it's not a bad idea because there's a fair amount of under-recognized uh, peripheral neuropathy that, that's out there or people who are like, oh, I'm diabetic, I just take McFormin, and my hemoglobin is like 7.2, and you're like, oh, that's not so bad, but they probably have some underlying that you might not recognize it. So everybody in my office gets examined, gets examined with this. So um, here's a case. A lot, going forward, we're just going to run through cases. So 41-year-old diabetes, end-stage renal, bimalleolar ankle fracture. When you fix it, you're going to sort of maybe do a little bit more fixation than you want, um, or nor more fixation than you normally do. I think this is reasonably fixed, no real problems. 
And then we have a 64-year-old man. He's obese with diabetes. Um, has a little medial mal, a little flick off the medial mal, but I don't know if you can see it in the images. He's got a uh, high fibula fracture. And so this is where we talk about over fixation of your syndesmosis uh, is good. And you know, a lot of people you're going to say, oh, we've got three screws in there. You're doing all right. But anybody with diabetes that you're managing, anybody with any sort of neuropathy, you're going to double the length of immobilization and double the time until weight bearing. It's just sort of the safest way to do it. And we don't love that because it's like, oh, their ankle's going to get stiff. But you trade a stiff ankle for a ankle to have, you know, if you're going to start dealing with diabetes. Um, and I look at this and I go, man, I probably should have put a fourth screw. This is a big guy. I maybe got lucky that he did okay with three. So now we're going to start looking at things that go bad. So this is a woman who had a pilon fracture. It's fixed eight weeks ago. Comes in with wound breakdown immediately. You can just sort of see that her distal tibia is eroding or going through Charcot, some sort of process like that. She gets framed. She gets washed out. She gets an antibiotic nail. She gets fused. Um, eventually, this even broke down, and she went on to amputation a few weeks, uh, about four months after this. I'm going to go through another one. 65-year-old man, diabetes, ankle fracture. You can sort of see medial malleolus, probably posterior malleolus. It's fixed, and again, this sort of goes with when you fix these, you have to fix these really, really stoutly. Um, the two screws going back to that posterior malleolus piece, probably not enough here. Breaks down, gets fixed. Breaks down again with medial wound problems. Gets an antibiotic nail. Eventually gets a final TTC fusion nail. So when we look at these, there's things that we can say, again, I'm not throwing, I don't live in a glass house, I'm, you know, I'm not going to throw stones here, but it's just sort of things to think about when you look at this and sort of looking at other people's, where other people have failed, sort of learning where you can make improvements. So, you know, in the first case, in the case on the upper right, um, inadequate fixation of that posterior mal piece when they started. Probably needed a plate back there to really get them fixed, get, get good fixation. Maybe, depending on the orientation of that medial mal piece, like we talked about in the last uh, thing, maybe some sort of buttress plate to help the medial mal from coming out. Similarly here, uh, the, the case on the bottom, maybe just inadequate fixation in the uh, sy no syndesmotic fixation, very small screws, very small plating laterally. That, those are all things that you might want to think about when you're looking at a diabetic. Be like, I want as many screws as I can get. I want as much syndesmotic fixation as I can get just to give stability to the construct. So over fixation is a good idea here. Um, if you're concerned, put an extra syndesmosis screw in. If you feel like it's really unstable, you can put Steinman pins, like the picture on the right, uh, you can put Steinman pins just to give you additional stability for, you know, three, four weeks just to hold it uh, while things start to settle down. Those are all techniques you can use to try and um, give these patients a shot at sort of keeping their stability. So minimal incisions, especially if you're talking about vascular paths. I personally have never put in a fibula nail, but if somebody has really, really bad skin, it's not the worst idea. Um, especially somebody that has a lot of vascular disease but maybe doesn't have neuropathy. Um, you know, it's a relatively small incision just at the t tip of the fibula. You don't get as much opportunity for syndesmotic fixation, but there's some evidence to say that people do, with a fibula nail, can actually do really well, uh, even elderly patients. So it's minimal incision if you're really worried about skin integrity or if people have blisters, things like that. Um, that's one way to start. Okay, that's another option you have that you maybe, we maybe don't think of all the time because it's not as common. Um, so we're just going to go through a handful of cases, uh, just to sort of, again, like I said, more see all of the ways these can break down so you can start to think of the ways you can try and prevent them from breaking down. So this is a 63-year-old female, diabetes, maybe has neuropathy, her Sims Weinstein test is, she sort of feels it, but sort of doesn't. You know, she gets fixed, um, and we can sort of look at this and go, hmm, when we see this we go, eh. Maybe we could have seen that coming, you know, a little unfixation. But even, we're talking about this is happening at three weeks. This isn't like far down the line. She's probably been non weight bearing in a splint, but this is where we sort of look at over fixation. And it's real easy to just say, hey, this has gone bad, let's go to a nail. If they're diabetic, if they're neuropathic, if they're low demand, giving them optimal fixation um, is a relatively good option for salvage as soon as you sort of start to see that happening. But sometimes, 
even when you do that, um, same thing, this woman comes to me four months out, uh, neuropathic, her skin wasn't fine, no, no history of infection. We give her a hind foot nail, and at nine weeks, one of the screws is coming out, but sort of tent her skin, so we take that out. At 12 weeks, she's been immobilized. We say, hey, you've been in a cast, non weight bearing for 12 weeks. Comes back one week after walking on it and the two other screws. So even a nail isn't a, is a complete salvage in this. I just took these screws out on Wednesday and threw a few more percutaneous ones around the nail to try and just give some stability. Because if this fails, her CT scan, no healing. Frequently non-unions and stuff in patients with neuropathy. Um, so if this fails, we're going to have to be looking at a frame. Uh, then you have some that are just really, really amazing. It's kind of amazing to see how this happens. Uh, diabetes, peripheral neuropathy, they've got all the risk factors for something to go bad. And they got fixed in Mexico. Um, so <laughs> they come back, they've got some wound healing on the medial side. They get, everything comes out, they get framed, they get the antibiotic workup, they get some antibiotic beads, wash it out. Listen, we've got syndism three syndesmotic screws, we've got a plate medially, we've got a nice, long, stout plate laterally, six weeks after it's fixed. Like, there, there was, you look at this and you go, hey, that looks really pretty good, you know? Like, if you finish that and you finish this, one of those cases, you finish in the oil and you go, yeah, we say, you know, this is looking awesome. Um, but six weeks. Um, gets washed out, gets an antibiotic nail, and just because it couldn't get any worse, breaks around the x fix. Okay? I didn't do this, this is not my case, thankfully. Um, what's one of my partner's case? So she just got this. I think she got this last Friday. Um, so literally anything that can happen, anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and that's where you need to get creative and sort of think about the different ways you can fix things, and if you're like, have any hesitance or anything to worry about, like, like this is the biggest thing. Over immobilize them, over fix them, don't let them wait there. Um, no boots, no tight ropes, nothing little, big stout plates, maximum fixation, that's what we need. As a comment on open ankle fractures, um, if you have an open ankle fracture and you're a diabetic, big, big problems. Um, 20, 30, 20 to 30 percent amputation rate kind of off the bat for those. So this is a gentleman who we saw who had an open ankle fracture that had been fixed four months ago and he kind of had a wound chronically. Um, and by the time he got transferred to us, by the time we debrided him, that was all that was left and viable. And this is what goes back to the beginning where I say you have to have a good relationship with plastics. You need to know people that you can't sit on this stuff. This isn't a healthy host, it's not somebody that can uh, um, you can be like, oh, I'll just give it a little Keflex. Like, if you see wound drainage or wound complication, you get in, you wash it out, you get plastics involved as soon as possible. Because when you have this little distal tibia, your only option is a baloney amputation. Unless you want to do a very, very long uh, course of uh, antibiotics, framing, nails, and leave somebody with a limb that's probably going to be about two inches short. Um, so in here, we, here we opted for a baloney amputation just to sort of allow the 74-year-old to sort of get back to get out of bed and not have a year of visits to a hospital. So take home points. If you have these, you actually got to fix them, even though you don't really want to. Uh, make sure you check everyone for neuropathy, because that's the, probably the biggest risk factor for failure in these. Uh, you need to prepare yourself and the patient for a complicated course. Overfixation, lots of, you know, two, three, four syndesmotic screws, no tight ropes, no mini plates, nothing like that. You got to over immobilize non bearing for a minimum of 10 weeks. And, and it's not a boot, right? Like, I know we're all like, oh, we don't want the ankle to get stiff. You don't put them in a boot because people cheat in boots. You put them in a cast, you keep them in a cast so that that way uh, they're doing, we're doing our best to mobilize and support the fixation. Uh, be aggressive with wounds and have a low threshold when things start to go bad to revise, to get people in a frame or to get a nail in. That's it.